Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Proper Properbarian and today we are here with a, a lot of new screenshots, with a lot of new content and with many new details, uh, both for old and for new mechanics that we've talked about that we haven't talked about, because this is a video on the monthly update video for Victoria 3 that went live yesterday. There was a lot of really good stuff in there, there were also many really good hats in there. Congratulations on all the hats, I hope that they will be in the game so that my pops can, you know, be well equipped for their jobs of course. Now we are going to jump into this, I made some collages so that you can tell what exactly I'm talking about, where exactly we are, what we are comparing and so on and so forth. So you know honestly without further ado let's just do it. What we have right here are two privately owned buildings, that is the arms industries and that is shipyards. One is level 1, one is tier 2. Uh, the most important thing I think to point out in the top section of each image is the fact that of course the arms industries is making a lot more money. That is 14.3 yearly productivity by employee, so per employee, meaning that they are much much more productive than they would be in the shipyards where it's only 6.7. Both of them are turning a profit but you know obviously the arms industry is doing better. In the video that is basically a screenshot that comes up when they talk about, for example, the arms industries benefiting from you being in a position of war because you need to produce the artillery, you need to buy it, the prices will go higher and so on and so forth. You can see that in the bottom as well. When you look at, for example, the small arms and the artillery icons on the right side in the arms industries, you will see that there are two money stacks that are golden, meaning that the price in the market is currently higher than the, you know, standard price would be, the base price, meaning you're making more money there. Um, on the other side, the shipyards, of course, yes, they are producing producing quite well, there are no shortages or anything of that sort, and there are even two levels of the shipyards, as of, you know, as I mentioned beforehand. However, there just isn't that big of a demand, so they are very close to the base price. Both the both of these ships, I I'll be, will be honest with you, I don't even know what both of these ships would be in this circumstance, but I hope that you know where I'm coming from there. Clearly, at this time, or whenever these screenshots are taken, the arms industries is making bank, and that means that, you know, the cash res uh, reserves, since they are full, that money that is then uh, the weekly balance, so what the actual profit is goes into the direct standard of living of the ownership pops. What is interesting here and what is really just something that they already made very apparent but that wasn't clear is the fact that despite the arms industries, oh sorry it was clear but maybe it wasn't visualized in a good way, but this really makes it clear. The arms industries are making mad cash, meaning that the ownership, you know, the, the pops that are owning this are making a crazy amount of money. However, the average annual annual wage, if you look over there, is only 5.54 per employee. On the other hand, the shipyards are actually 6.01. So this would mean that the labor market in the entire market, but also in the state of the shipyards in Lower Egypt is much more competitive than the arms industries. Otherwise, the arms industries would have to pay more money to their workers, you know, which would of course then be a reduction in the weekly balance since it would go into wages. This is really, really cool. You can quite clearly see that, you know, uh, it works as intended. The labor market pressure, the pressure of goods, it does play a big role here and it makes it so that with the arms industries as it stands right now, basically whoever owns this, so the capitalists will be getting a lot of money from, well, you probably, because the barracks are of course the ones that are buying the artillery that are buying these small arms and this makes it so that they're making cash but their workers are not. Uh, the last thing to point out I think in this screenshot is the fact that there is now an auto expand button so I assume that you can say hey if you have the potential of filling this factory you should expand the factory because it is very very important. I highly doubt that this is just a general auto expand button just endlessly expanding. I hope that there is some sort of calculation whether you can actually fill this new level, this new tier of the building. Either way, pretty cool interface and definitely shows the effect of war on the wealth and the labor market. Now what we have right here is different from the buildings that we had beforehand because these are government buildings. These are both naval bases, one is in Lower Egypt, that's the left one, and one is in Bahia. Bahia? I'm actually not certain, it doesn't really matter. One is tier 25, so they have quite the expansions there, and then the other one is merely, I guess, tier 10. Uh, these bases, first of all, are very different, of course, because they are government buildings, meaning that you are investing in this, this is your money directly, your tax money going into this, uh, and it also means, of course, that they play a bit of a bit a different role. Naval bases, maybe you've forgotten this, so let me just explain it real quick. Naval bases are basically the barracks of the sea. Here is where you take, for example, cannons, where you take ships, maybe later on radios, I don't know, I would assume maybe radios, maybe if you build an aircraft carrier, maybe even planes, right? That is where you put these sort of things and then they are recruited into flotillas that your admirals command and your admirals will then be able to do missions on the sea. 
The most important part of what we can actually see here in this very collage is the fact that the left naval base, so in Lower Egypt, is actually capable of utilizing every single, you know, production limit that it has. Uh, 25 tiers appear to directly reflect into 25 ships, which, uh, whatever type of ship this is, maybe a man of war, I'm actually not quite certain, doesn't really matter. On the right side though, the naval bases are tier 10, but they only use 9 ships. That is, and we have this neat little symbol down there, the red crate, because there appears to be a shortage within your market for this good. Um, the fascinating thing, first of all, of course, there's a big impact, you can see it in by here, there's a shortage of this good, meaning that the price of the good is much over the base price, so while the naval base needs to pay more, who actually benefits here are the people in the shipyards and their owners, because they will be selling their goods at a higher price, meaning that they can have more in their own pockets. But the other interesting thing is that on the right side, if you compare these stats, so Navy Offense, Navy Defense, Training Rate, and then of course also the actual Naval Base uh, stats on the left, they are exactly the same. Um, I don't know whether this means that, you know, there is no malice that gets applied there, but clearly there's a red crate there implying that there will be a malice, but maybe that malice gets applied in the Admiral's uh, fleet, maybe in the actual flotilla, you will then see, oh, okay, so this one comes from, uh, you know, a naval base that usually would be producing products with a navy offense of plus 10, but maybe since there's a shortage, it's only plus 9, because we only have 9 out of 10 possible uh, man of wars that are being transported to us. I don't know the exact answer there, but you can clearly tell in this interface that there is a shortage, that something is going wrong, and that, you know, you might want to take care of it. Interestingly enough, of course, as well, both of these provide naval uh, uh, power, so that is how large a flotilla, how large a fleet of a general, uh, of an admiral can be, meaning that the left one, for example, could supply an admiral that needs 25 ships under his command, because that is, you know, the maximum that he can fill. If that were a number that he needs, then this is what the naval base in Lower Egypt could do all on its own. Very interesting nonetheless. Again, this is a bit of a different one compared to the first one because this is purely a government building. There are no ownership pops that benefit from you, you know, having a good number in this building. In fact, the building will always be in the negative because these are just expenses. But on the other hand, if you think about it, all of these buildings are supplied by private industries and capitalists are benefiting from that. So there is still a big impact in there. Uh, of course, there are also wages, but we can't really see the details here because it just reads it in government expenses in the top. It doesn't split it off, you know, depending on the uh, average annual wage and so on. All right, so that was everything on the naval base screenshots that we had here. Now we're moving over to a different government building and not even the building itself, at least not for starters, but rather a production method that can be applied in the buildings. Here we have two different production methods. The left one are specialist companies production methods. So specialist companies is the generalized uh, production method where you can then choose specific me methods out of. And currently we are applying the machine gunner specialist company production method. Uh, you can do this if the country has invented automatic machine guns. We talked about this in the technology uh, technology dev diary as well, that most technologies, and this is the base philosophy of Victoria 3, that you research will not immediately give you a bonus. Rather, they will make it so that you can then apply and pay for a bonus. I personally really, really like that. Uh, predicted impact on weekly balance with full employment after good substitutions. So this is if you were to push in the production method machine gunners, which we can't because we haven't researched it. But basically, this would be much more expensive, meaning you need to be able to afford it in the first place. Of course, there are modifiers here, the unscaled modifiers appears, maybe this means this is the modifier before shortage, you know, before the effects of an admiral, of a general, and so on. Then below that we have additional goods consumption, we would have to pay for five more small arms units and five more ammunition, we talked about this as well, of course, that uh, an increase in quality is depicted as an increase in quantity in the game, um, you can see that currently small arms are already at sh in short supply, maybe even, you know, looming uh, at the edge of the shortage, uh, our ammunition, on the other hand, just a very normal pricing point, so that seems quite normal. Now, the interesting thing here on the left is that timed modifiers apply if you were to change this, and that is equipment adjustment. They talked about this as well, that if you change one of the production methods in the barracks, your armies won't be fighting very efficiently until the modifier time is running out. So I think that is a good idea. It makes it, of course, so, you know, they, they already said this, but now we have it visually. It makes it so that you need to prepare your army in the peacetime, because if you don't do that and you re-gear, as you're already, as the offensive of the enemy is in full swing, you will be losing. That should be very clear. Um, I wonder what show per level values would truly mean. 
Uh, very interested in that, but we don't really have any access, so let's just skip over that. On the right side, we have artillery support production method. This one, uh, currently we have cannon artillery, and if we change this, we get bigger modifiers, we get more power projection, meaning that we get more prestige, which is very important for your ranking in the world overall. And then, of course, we get additional artillery goods consumption. All of that makes perfect sense. You need to, you know, of course, have artillery research, then you can go ahead with that, and it applies to the barracks so far, so good. I think both of these are very interesting, very... Uh, honestly, I'm happy with the tooltips, I could say, because you can see the modifiers that are applied, you can see uh, the goods consumption that increases, and, you know, especially with the machine gun attack on the top left, you can see how much you will actually have to pay for this. The predicted impact on weekly balance with full employment, right? This is all good, because this allows you and the AI to make meaningful decisions. Alright, what we have here is another production method. This is the organization production method, and in this case we have line infantry selected. You can see we get offense, defense, we get training rate, and we get power projection. But then we also have to pay, of course, small arms, and the employment structure of the entire building changes. You have uh, 250 officers and 4,750 servicemen. I assume that this, much like in any other building, the expected ratio of employees will change as you change the organization production method as well. But this was just a short uh, intermezzo, basically. So let's move on to this one. I like this one a lot. This one is a screenshot of your firearms manufacturing. You can see muskets, rifles, repeating rifles, and bold action rifles. Um, this is an actual production site, so these are not barracks. This is something uh, related to, for example, the actual small arms manufacturer. Right, and currently we are creating uh, bolt action rifles. Uh, sorry, I, I actually believe we're currently creating uh, muskets and we are looking at switching to rifles, uh, which is bolt action rifles. Now, we can't actually do that because we haven't invented it, meaning that we, well, don't have the tech, we don't know how to do it. But what you can very clearly see, and we have it in the tooltip, but we also have it just as a quick overview in the actual, uh, you know, uh, just the first button for the firearms manufacturing production method. You can see that producing the bolt action rifles takes a lot more. You need to have steel all of a sudden, you need to have oil, you need to have tools, and you need uh, a bit less iron, but the iron is of course required for the steel. Additionally, the actual setup uh, setup of the uh, of the building's employment structure also changes significantly, which means you need a higher educated population. This tooltip and the way they are now designing this, quite frankly, is really really cool because you will see directly here, you will put 1,100 laborers out of work, and if they don't have the potential to become engineers, then they will struggle, they will become unhappy, and so on. In previous games, uh, Victoria 2, but again, it's a 10-year-old game, let's forget about that, but in many other games, this doesn't really happen. Stellaris also says you need to go and actually implement new tech to, for example, have it in your ships, but the reality is that if you retool something, if you upgrade a building, it's still the very same pop that can work in that building. And of course, that is, you know, a much less sophisticated than what we have here. Very, very happy with this. Very, very happy with the tooltip as well. Because, quite frankly, I mean, this is just a, a pretty cool one uh, to, to work in. And I just noticed this, actually, now that I looked at it. No, no, Bolt Action Rifles is the last tech that we could apply here. We are currently doing muskets, but I was looking at rifles instead of Bolt Action Rifles. It doesn't really matter. It's a very similar affair, I think. Either way, uh, I like the tooltips. I think they have done a lot of work when it comes to the depiction of this. And... Yeah, it would be very, very costly to kick out the laborers and, you know, then hope that you can actually make the big jump. This is this big jump from muskets to bolt action rifles. It might actually be something that you primarily will, uh, you know, uh, recognize or rather will meet uh, when it comes to an unrecognized nation. When you, you know, very speedily try to catch up with the rest of the world, you will just skip rifles. You might just skip repeating rifles and be at bolt action rifles, but that could make your population very unhappy as they suddenly would be out of work. Very interesting dynamics in here, no doubt about it. So, what we have right here is the mobility production method of the barracks in the state of wherever we are. I believe it is Brazil. Um, currently, we have cavalry there, of course, so this is a production method that enhances how fast your unit can move forward. When you look at the Battle Provinces Captured modifier, for example, this is, of course, important if you quickly want to conquer more land to actually push your enemy into submission. Uh, we currently have cavalry, but we are looking at the modifiers for armored division. You can see that we don't have the technology mobile armor, so we can't actually do this, but if we did, it would cost us minus 1.8k every single week. Yeah, that is pretty significant. I do think uh, that they would probably not enjoy that because who's producing tanks, you know, when there is still Piratini? You can see it in the bottom there. When that is still present because this is clearly 1836. There are no tanks. You can't really do this for cheap and you would most likely have a shortage if you could go through with it because nobody's building tanks in the first place. Now let's take a look at the modifiers. Plus 50 army offense. That is pretty significant. Plus 50% battle provinces captured. 
That is very significant. That is what moves your trench warfare into the actually right direction rather than being very static. And then we have plus 50% battle devastation. That makes a lot of sense as well, quite frankly. Now, uh, initially when I looked at this, I said to myself, oh, wait a minute, aerial reconnaissance and armored division, they are exclusive from one another, meaning that, you know, you either have planes or you have the armor division, but that is incorrect. Because as you can see, uh, to have armored divisions as a mobility uh, production method, you need both planes and tanks, and then of course the oil to run both of them, which I think is a really good idea. I think the way it works out there is basically an additional combination, an advancement, rather than an exchange. I think that makes perfect sense. So yeah, I like what we're seeing here. I think that this should definitely be something that can simulate World War I in terms of the actual front advancing. Once you have trench warfare and you don't have tanks, it will be very difficult for you to actually go ahead with the battle provinces captured. Uh, but if you go ahead and actually, you know, bring your armored divisions, then you can make the progress that, for example, the allies were making thanks to their tank units that were supporting the infantry moving forward. So, yeah, looks very good to me. Let's move on. And out of the production methods, we now have something that is really, really good news in my opinion. I was talking about it when they announced that this wouldn't be in. Uh, I was talking about this in relationship to Napoleon III, who led his armies both during the actual uh, war against Austria, so uh, together with the Italians, and then in the war against Prussia, where he of course got captured and that was the end of Napoleon's III reign in France. This is Mohammed Shah Qajar. Uh, I believe, yeah, he is the Shah, he is the ruler of Persia. But you can notice that he's also a commander. He is an actual general. This is really, really good. I, I personally really, really like this because what it means is that, well, your rulers can actually be on the battlefield. They could even die on the battlefield, especially in aristocratic societies. Of course, this plays a big role. It's not very likely that your democratically elected president of the republic is going to go out and, you know, hey, give commands from his horse. But your king, your emperor, your duke, and so on, they may very well do it. Now, let's take a look at the right side. This is, again, our Shah Mohammed Shah Qajar. Uh, he's the dear fella that we have on the left as well. And here we have a breakdown of who he really is. There is something that I can't explain, and that is his rank. He's in the first rank, so this is a, a very uh, low rank, I, I would say. He's a Brigadier General and slash Commodore. But Commodore is, of course, something that you utilize for, uh, you know, on the on the sea side, so in the command structure of everything that is naval. I think it might just say he has the general limit and the general political clout of Brigadier General and Commodore, that there's no difference there. I'm not certain. He's clearly a Brigadier General. You can see that he in the bottom left has some uh, units underneath him that are, you know, troops. Uh, his location is in Persia. That is where he was drafted. Of course, it makes a lot of sense. He is 10 out of 10 units. He has no attrition risk right now because he is not mobilized. And then he is in the interest group of the landowners. So basically aristocracy, right? He is not very popular, it seems. Um, his character traits are imperious, persistent, and artillery commander. He's a traditionalist and he is Shiite. I will tell you, Popularity um, is something that we haven't heard much about. If I'm not wrong, I don't think I don't think I am though. But we do know that you can form governments, especially in uh, monarchies that are led by somebody, you know, the the actual monarch, and his interest group or their interest group isn't actually in government. That this is possible, we have heard before. It could be that the more popular you are the more legitimate does a government with your faction become, and the less popular uh, you are, the more legitimate does a government become that does not have your interest group in it. So, be popular and the landowners will legitimize the government, be unpopular and the landowners will drive legitimacy away. I'm not sure whether that is how it works, but that is what came to mind for me. Let, you, uh, let me know what you think, because that is, of course, a big question. All right, and here we have two more generals. On the right side, it is Fuat al-Biblawi, and on the left side, it is written under the general location, we have Rühle von Lilienstern, which is only his last name. This could be, what, I think Otto August, right? Yeah, Otto August Rühle von Lilienstern. Uh, Rühle, Rühle von Lilienstern, I've never heard of this before, I just googled this, literally, but he apparently is part of an aristocratic house within Germany. And he appears to be... Uh, uh, you know, actually mobilized. You can see it in the top right, where the swords and the flags are actually colored in, rather than a button, like for Fuat al-Biblawi. He has control of 25 units. He is a tier 2 general, and he is a part of the petite bourgeoisie. He got a couple of traits, forget about that. And he is at the Castile Burgundy front. More on that front, we're gonna see in just a bit. There are some really, really good screenshots there, but we're gonna check that out, right? Um, he is active, and him being active means that he has a 20% attrition chance. That is crazy. 
I am not sure we're going to see an attrition modifier tooltip in a second. I am not sure how to make sense of these numbers yet, I'll be honest with you. But he is currently losing 500 troops per week. 500 troops are half a battalion per week. That is insane. That is a crazy loss. Uh, the other important thing that I want to point out here is, of course, that when you look at Advanced Front, that is, uh, you know, this button in the bottom for Rühle von Lilienstern, you will see, uh, you know, a, a, a target for archers in the top right of the Advanced Front icon. I don't know what it means. It could mean that he's currently already engaging in it, that he's not, you know, mobilizing towards this location, but that he's actually active. It could mean that he is trying to get better at it. He's clearly not. I, I originally was like, maybe he's training, but he's definitely not training advancing a front because, well, he's actually at war. We're going to see that there are some great screenshots of Prussia conquering France. It looks very interesting. On the right side, there is nothing too interesting except that Standby has the very same archer target in Fuad Al-Biblawi's view that advanced front has for Rühle von Lilienstern. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there's anything too interesting except maybe that uh, Fuad Al-Biblawi, I think, has maxed out his unit capacity, which is 30, meaning that Rühle von Lilienstern has not maxed it out because he's only at 25, but both are at the same level of the general. And then Fuad Al-Biblawi is, of course, a part of the rural folk interest group. Let's move on. Here we have basically the same thing, except going on for admirals. We have an unnamed admiral. I think it might be John Grenfell. If you look at the tooltip in the bottom, I'm pretty sure that's him because he, he is tier 2, right? And he can have 30 warships, but I will be honest with you. I don't know whether that is him. Uh, most importantly, what we can see is that both of them also have this archer target underneath them. One is a member of the armed forces, the other is a member of the industrialists. And yeah, I, I think that is basically it for this screenshot. It basically just was something that I wanted to show because the archer target is there both for generals and admirals. What does it mean? I have no idea. All right, now here we have a genuinely beautiful screenshot. I was not the biggest fan. I told you this and I think it was obvious that it is of course work in progress, but when we were looking at the actual front line at the very first presentation where Mexico and Texas were fighting it out, we were not even close to this visual fidelity. Can it still be better? I personally believe so, yes, very much, but look at this. Okay, so what do we actually see? Russia in this war, which they appear to be in together with the Netherlands and with Spain against France, has made significant advances. Strasbourg, Nancy, uh, Dijon, they have all fallen. And at this point, uh, there appear to be some pockets, but more on the pockets in a second. Where you are looking, when you're looking at the locations with the two swords, with a circle around it and the Prussian flag, these appear to be indicating one Russian, one battles that Prussia has won. There we go. What you can see close to, you know, the actual front lines is, for example, smoke going up. So be that fire, be that trench warfare, be that actual battles, you know, line infantry firing, that sort of stuff. I'm not certain. But I will tell you that this is already a much more active map than what we saw originally. I really, really enjoy what is going on there. I hope that the animations are smooth as hell, because if they are, this could really look good. I would love it even more, and I don't think this is a secret, if we saw some actual men running around, you know, some uniformed soldiers going around and saying, I will beat the hell out of everybody, because that is my job. If we could see the actual line infantry standing there and shooting, or the artillery, or the tanks, and so on, that would be gorgeous, because right now, of course, even if it is animation, yes, we are basically a bit more removed than, you know, we are in the games commonly, where you actually can see these sprites standing around, but sprites would still be nice. Either way, what is so very interesting about this screenshot, you know, I mean, we've already seen a front line, we've already seen the flames, which indicates devastation, by the way, so how much the actual region is suffering. But the most important part here of this very screenshot, in my opinion, is the fact that we clearly have a pocket. The Rhine Basin HQ appears to have been pocketed. What does that mean? First of all, it confirms pockets will happen. Second of all, let's consider how this could have happened. I would assume that these sort of pockets would only form if I rush through you and you are not there uh, at the front line to actually stop my rushing. How is this determined? I mean, we don't know the exact nature of this, but what we do know is the fact that uh, certain organization forms give you a greater chance of stopping the enemy, uh, you know, at proceeding even further into your land after winning a battle. And then certain, you know, uh, organization forms make it so that you can go in faster, that you can succeed and be more aggressive. In this case, Maybe, if we, you know, want to apply the historical situation of the Franco-Prussian War, maybe France mobilized far too slowly. They didn't see the threat, they were positioned poorly in the sense that their armies weren't fully present, 
And then the army that was present basically got screwed. The Rhine Basin HQ now has a general in it who has no chance of escaping, it seems, as long as you close that front. The Rhine Basin HQ general that is on the French side will have no supply, meaning that his armies will suffer more and more as the weeks progress and then you can take them apart. I like it. I really, really like this. The depictions have become much, much better. They have become beautiful. The map as a whole, of course, looks gorgeous. I would really like it again if we had actual sprites, even if they are significantly smaller than they usually would be. If you look at the smoke next to Dijon, I would really like it if there were some tiny min, maybe, you know, in, in regiments. And I mean truly tiny in this context. I would like that a lot compared to just seeing the smoke, but yeah, what we're seeing right here clearly looks really, really good. We have the advantage, the logistical advantage, much like it would have been historically, you know, um, or much like it was historically in the Franco-Prussian War. I read about that uh, quite significantly, actually, how they overran the French forces, basically, and split them off into the fortresses where they then were captured, you know, they were basically, uh, uh, they had no chance of ever becoming free, and they were separated from the rest of the army as they, of course, had to sit in the fortress that they retreated into. So, this is pretty cool. Anything else what is in there, uh, we can see that the front line in the west, so that is the front line that actually, you know, looks towards Paris, that looks towards the rest of the French uh, country, that has an AT advantage for Prussia because the French barely have any units left in it. You have to wonder whether they cheated in some units for Prussia because this is a huge superiority in numbers. Uh, whereas on the Rhine Basin HQ, I actually can't see anything. I don't know whether units are currently assigned to that. It has to be pointed out, of course, as well, that there are different strategic regions, right? There's a strategic region there that is the actual Rhine Basin, and then we have northern and southern France. I'm not entirely certain whether this means that we don't have troops at the Rhine Basin HQ, or whether this maybe just happened, this sort of pocket, right? And that there isn't any calculation going on yet. Either way, in my opinion, a gorgeous screenshot. This is what I'm looking for. And I can already tell you, the stories this can tell, the destruction of armies, but also of civilian lives this can tell, Eventually, I'll get on your nerves by, uh, you know, finally uh, finally actually working on a video about a crackpot theory for CK3 warf Warfare, how I would like to see it, because I think a system much like this that simulates occupation, that simulates devastation, that simulates the loss of life, could also be applied for uh, CK3 if you instead focused on the characters much, much more significantly. Either way, beautiful, beautiful screenshot. All right, and let's move on to an exactly as beautiful screenshot. I think this screenshot is straight up the exact same scenario as we just had it. I think this primarily because we're looking at a situation where the 16, 80 advantage, and then 146 Prussian units is the exact same number scheme right there. And uh, we've clearly selected the Castile Burgundy front. I don't know why it would be called Castile Burgundy front, but Burgundy makes sense. Castile, I kind of don't get but I don't think it really matters either, because what we're looking at is the same screenshot, and then if you click on the Castile Burgundy front, it shows you which generals are assigned and where they come from. We have a North France HQ general with 25 units, a South France HQ with 30 units, but I think... Oh, and 23 uh, 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 units that are just uh, deployed, right? So basically, these are the people that are the militias, these are in their garrisons, that are also coming to the aid in South France HQ for the French general there. Um, we have ourselves have one general applied. I think he has 47 troops or something. Uh, that is in the Rhine Basin HQ. And the rest probably is Dutch and Spanish. I'm not. I'm actually not certain though. Either way, what really matters right here is uh, that we're looking basically at the same screenshot from this distance. I just have to tell you, I love the way the map looks. I love the clouds. But more importantly, I think... Warfare is really coming along. I am I'm not entirely sold, I will tell you, on the flags. Maybe the flags need to be slightly larger so that it doesn't repeat as often, but in general, this looks truly, truly beautiful. Um I am very curious about the inner works of forming a pocket and so on, but I think we are all curious about that. But we'll just have to wait until we get confirmation one way or another, you know, how that works. All right, and here we have another frontline screenshot together with the very first interface of a battle. Um, I can't tell too much from that interface, but let's start with the front line anyway. It looks like this is a war between us, so we are Afghanistan here, and Persia, and Kalat appears to also be on our side, primarily because we could, at least from the looks of it, send one of our generals to Kalat's border with Persia, which to me at the very least implies that there's war uh, warfare going on there as well. You can see that the front lines are basically divided, you know, by the provinces, not the states, but the provinces within the state, uh, on each side, so like one deep, right? Then they fight, uh, and we're currently not having a good time. You can see that they have 45 units there, we have 15, and we have a chance of winning 
with minus 97. Uh, early on when we were at the Castile Bergen in front, we had an 80% advantage. Here we have a 97% disadvantage, meaning that we are very, very likely to lose. Um, that is not good. That is very bad. But more importantly, on the right side, in this conflict it appears, we have the Battle of Khorasan. Uh, on the left side, that is us. We are Afghanistan. That is the black flag. And we have a green icon next to us that looks like maybe stealth, maybe uh, being subtle, maybe... Partisan attacks. They they did confirm partisan attacks are in, but they also said that there wouldn't be ruler generals. So, hey, they can't lie to me anymore. I don't know what it means. I I have to guess that it might mean that your general is applying a tactic that they favor. Meaning that if you have a general that doesn't like mountain warfare, that doesn't understand mountain warfare, they may favor a tactic that is bad here. Meaning the general selection would be even more pivotal. On the right side, we have Persia with. Something that looks like a strike, like you're basically striking, you know, strike force sending in maybe, maybe a targeted, uh, targeted attack. Maybe they want to go in hard and take a lot of territory, which will of course be very difficult because we are in mountainous Afghanistan. Um, then underneath that we have in this battle 18 of our units participating, we're not doing so hard, and then 41 of their units. You can see that uh, this must have been taken before we were, or actually this must have been taken I assume maybe... I'm, I'm actually not sure because we only have 15 units active there. Maybe it has been taken after the other general was mobilized. You can see it there. Afghanistan has two generals that could theoretically be mobilized but currently are not. Not actually certain though. This is just my best guess. Uh, on the right side as well you can then see that during the battle the fighting capable men were rapidly falling for us. We did not have a good time. Uh, <laughs> my god. We were like what 30,000 initially? And now we're at 18,000? It's awful. This is just uh, truly terrible. Uh, on the other hand, the the men on the side of uh, Persia are having a much better time. Our army survival rate, though, is fairly high. I assume that this means, uh, you know, that we're looking at a situation where possibly, um, you know, most of the people that go home, won't, or rather, most of the people that get out of the battle are not dead. Rather, they are just wounded and become dependents, which is also terrible for our economy. Uh, but more importantly, this actually shows Afghanistan, so us, attacking. I don't know why we would be attacking, you should have just defended, but you can see that was a bloody affair, and Afghanistan is sure not to enjoy that. You know, their population will surely be very unhappy. Now, let's move on to the very last collage that we have right here. We can see on the left side the stats for Prussia uh, in the France versus Spain war. Again, as I said, this is a war between the Dutch, us, and Spain against France. Um, our wounded are, you know, 12,814 of those that are wounded happened in battle, and then 17,600 due to attrition. That is crazy. No numbers are finished, no numbers are finalized, but attrition plays a huge role, and it's a role that the player will actually have a significant impact in, because logistics are what you manage to a huge degree in this warfare system. The battles, sure, 12,814, that is what it is, you have to choose the right generals, the right troops set up, but the attrition is something that you need to look into, whether you can get more infrastructure, whether you can prioritize your barracks and so on and so forth, right now, very self-evidently, they are not having a great time. <laughs> More gone from attrition than wounded. But they did say that as well, of course, that most people die to attrition, not to battles. And then let's take a look at the death stats. They are very similar in terms of the ratio uh, compared to the wounded stats when it comes to battle wounded and attrition. So 70.7 thousand Prussians died, 30,000 in battle, and 40,737 due to attrition. That is wild. I can't wait or a World War One like situation and looking at the stats, because those are going to be truly insane. Your nation afterwards will not be the same. Until the end of the game, your economy, your nation, your society will be defined in a different fashion if one million of your pops die just in the first year. That is going to be crazy. I, I, gotta, be, I gotta be honest with you, this is a really cool system. Uh, the way it plays into it and the way the actual realistic pop death numbers come out, making it so that the pops will suffer significantly and with that your economy, your state, your military and so on. Really excited. On the right side we can see that a general is mobilized. Uh, the estimated cost per week of course goes up because they're mobilized and then you can see that what they actually need is small arms, tools, ammunition and artillery. They are bought in two different state regions. Now I believe that this means that this general is getting their troops from two different barracks. Right, so from two different barracks buildings, one maybe in Berlin, one maybe in, let's say, Mecklenburg, right, or Pomerania. 
And that is why there are two state regions. This can mean that you, to supply a general, will have to pay a crazy amount of money. If you have a general that has their barracks in a state that is inaccessible, there, there isn't enough infrastructure, it is completely overextended, it can't get the goods and it needs to pay extra. In that case, you would actually have higher prices. Right here, all the prices in the two state regions that the general is uh, sourcing their material from are the same. You know, the small arms, tools, ammunition, and artillery always cost the same. 81, 81, 44.8, 44.8, and so on. But that is a really interesting dynamic because this is a huge aspect of logistics, no doubt about it. We're looking at a situation where you need to make a choice. Not just based on, okay, you know... Uh, where can I recruit enough population? But then you need to make a choice that makes it so that that population can actually get what it needs to fight at the front line. And you need to do that for all the barracks that are somewhere. I like this. I think this is a really cool system. Uh, of course, you do need the connection to the actual troops at the front, right? But no, this is really, really neat. Now, here's the thing where I'm not, like, I kind of don't get the math, I guess. Attrition. Unit's risk of attrition is 20% per week due to... Base attrition risk, 20%. 20% from commander divided by supply, 100%. So, I'm pretty sure their supply is basically 100%. If it was uh, lower, then it would be worse. You know, attrition would be higher. Uh, but the base attrition that you get is 20%. And since we're perfectly supplied, the base attrition applies with its base value. I thought this would mean that like 20% of a battalion will die in a week. But it's a risk of attrition. And then down below that we have units which are affected by attrition lose from 5% to 15% of Minto casualties. I don't really understand. So I actually maybe I do understand. Let me know what you think. I think this means there is a 20% chance that attrition applies. And if attrition applies, there's another role because the number, the, the height of the attrition will actually be 5 to 15%. And then this boils down to an average of 2% attrition per week. I think that's what it means, right? You tell me what you think. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So 20% chance to get an attrition and then the attrition is rolled out between 5 and 15%, whatever you roll there. And in average, on average, this will amount to 2% attrition per week, which means 292 men lost to casualties. Costly affair. Certainly a very costly affair. Um... This was a really cool monthly update video. In my opinion, we saw the tooltips have come a long way. They give you so much information now. We saw the UI for buildings gives you so much more information. You have the auto build button. We saw rulers as generals. We saw the great front lines. We saw the battle interface. So much in there. Let me know what you think. I really, really enjoyed this one. Uh, I hope they keep them coming. The last monthly update was already really good. I hope they keep them coming in this quality because this most certainly had a lot of new information. Let me know what you think about all of this in the comments. Love you and see you later. Alligator.